In this lesson, we are going to discuss the reflection of light. At the end of this video lesson, you should be able to discuss the reflection of light and law of reflection in mirrors and explain how images formed by mirrors are described qualitatively. We have previously discussed the behavior of light when it undergoes reflection. We have defined reflection as the bouncing off of light on a reflective surface. But how does light bounce off on a reflective surface? To look at this phenomenon, let us look at one light ray only. The light ray hits the reflective surface and then bounces off away from the surface. Perpendicular to the reflective surface is an imaginary line which serves as the point in which the light will bounce off. We call this the normal line. The light coming towards the reflective surface is the incident ray. The light going away from the reflective surface as it bounces off is the reflected ray. The incident ray forms an angle of theta sub i which is measured from the normal. This is called the angle of incidence. Similarly, the reflected ray forms an angle of theta sub r which is measured from the normal. This is called the angle of reflection. In reflection of light, the two angles are always equal. This is what we call the law of reflection. Aside from this, the law of reflection also states that the incident ray, normal line, and the reflected ray lie on one plane. Let us look at some problem examples for the law of reflection. For the first problem, a ray of light is incident on a surface at 37 degrees. Find the angle of reflection and the angle between the incident and reflected rays. It is highly recommended that we draw the problem first so that we can see if we have identified the given quantities correctly. So we draw the reflective surface and the normal line which is perpendicular to it. We then draw the two rays. It is not required to follow the angle measurement of the rays from the normal unless stated. From this, we can already identify the given quantity and that is 37 degrees. We need to be careful on what to label 37 degrees because it can either be the angle from the surface or angle from the normal. Since it is clearly stated on the problem that it is from the normal, 37 degrees is our angle of incidence. Following the law of reflection, we have theta sub i is equal to theta sub r. This means that our angle of reflection is also 37 degrees. For the second unknown, we are just going to add the two angles that means that the angle between the two rays is equal to 74 degrees. For the second problem, a ray of light hits a surface at an angle of 28 degrees from the surface. What is the angle of reflection formed by the light? Again, it is better to draw the problem first, so we have the reflective surface and the normal line. Second, we can draw the light rays even if we do not follow the accurate angle measurements. Now, this is the crucial part. We need to identify what angle is 28 degrees. It is mentioned in the problem that 28 degrees is measured from the surface. That means we put 28 degrees here. Since what we need is the angle of incidence which is measured from the normal, we need to look for the value for this angle. Since the normal line is perpendicular to the surface, it forms a 90 degree angle. And since the two angles are formed by the rays, the sum of these two angles is always 90. To solve for the incident angle, we just subtract the angle from the surface from 90 degrees. Plugging in the values, we have 90 degrees minus 28 degrees. This gives us 62 degrees. Following the law of reflection, the angle of reflection should also be 62 degrees. This problem should give you a better understanding of reflection, being under geometric optics as we have used rays and angle measurements to compute for the angle of reflection of light. Any reflecting surface that is flat and smooth follows the law of reflection. This smooth reflection creates crisp mirror images and is called specular reflection. This crisp mirror image is due to the fact that parallel light rays hit one smooth surface. But what if the water is highly reflective but is wavy? Does it still follow law of reflection? The answer is yes. This is what we call diffuse reflection. Instead of creating crisp images, it creates distorted images because the rays do not become parallel due to the roughness of the surface. It still follows the law of reflection because the different points on the rough surface would have different normal lines in which the angle of reflection would still be equal to the angle of incidence. Specular reflection is the science behind mirrors. Mirrors are not necessarily silver plates of glass. 
mirrors or any surfaces that are smooth enough to produce regular reflection of light incident upon it. Before we discuss the different types of mirrors, let us first discuss the images formed by mirrors. Images can be described qualitatively and quantitatively. In this lesson, we are going to focus on the qualitative characteristics of images. The first qualitative characteristic is the type of image formed. Images may be either real or virtual. This qualitative characteristic primarily describes the formation of the image based on the intersection of the light rays. The image on the left is a real image, and the image on the right is a virtual image. The spoon acts as the mirror. The front or shallow part of the spoon allows the light rays to meet, forming the image in front of the mirror. Since it is in front of the mirror, the image can be projected on a separated screen. On the other hand, the back part of the spoon does not allow light to intersect, forming the image at the back of the mirror, a location in which light cannot pass through. Since it is at the back already, it cannot be focused on a separate screen. Another evident difference between the two is the image's orientations. The orientation of the image is dependent on the object's position. There are two things to consider in image orientation. First is the vertical inversion which means that the upper side of the object becomes the lower side of the image. If this happens, the image is said to be inverted. If not, the image is upright. The second is the horizontal inversion. Images are always laterally inverted. This means that your left side will always be your image's right side, and your right side will always be your image's left side. It is important to take note that real images are always inverted, and virtual images are always upright. This also means that when the light rays intersect in front of the mirror to form an image, the image will be inverted. On the other hand, if the light rays intersect at the back of the mirror to form an image, the image will always be upright. For the next qualitative characteristic of images, we have the image size. There are three possibilities for the image size. Images may either be reduced, same-sized, or enlarged. To describe the size of the image, we should just compare it with the original size which is the object size. Thus, for reduced, the image is smaller than the object. For same size, the size does not change. And lastly, for enlarged, the image is larger than the object. So there we have our three qualitative characteristics of images. We can also qualitatively describe the location of the image depending on the points on the mirror. However, we will be discussing how to qualitatively pinpoint the image on the next lessons. For now, we are going to focus on identifying the two classifications of mirrors and their parts which will be used for the qualitative description of the location of the image. There are two classifications or types of mirrors, plane mirrors and spherical mirrors. Plane mirrors are flat mirrors which we usually have in our homes. Spherical mirrors are taken from the surface of a sphere. Let us look at the image formation in plane mirrors. For image formation in plane mirrors, let us consider this paper clip placed in front of or outside the mirror. This is the reflective surface of the mirror. On the other side is the back or the inside of the mirror. This is the non-reflective surface. To easily remember this, just think of how you look at yourselves in front of the mirror. You are standing outside the mirror. You can see your reflection inside or at the back of the mirror. The light will hit the reflective surface following the law of reflection. It cannot pass through inside since it has already bounced off. After reflection, we may notice that there is no intersection of light that will dictate the formation of the image. With this, we may extend the reflected rays inside the mirror. But this does not mean that light penetrates the interior of the mirror. As we can see here, an intersection is formed. This means that this is the tip where the exact part of the object is formed in the image. Now, let us describe the images formed in plane mirrors. The image is formed at the back or inside or behind the mirror. It is formed at the same distance with respect to the object. Since it is formed at the back, it is automatically virtual. And since it is virtual, it is automatically upright. And as mentioned earlier, it is also laterally reversed. Lastly, we can see that there is no difference in the size of the object as seen in the image. Thus, the image has the same size with that of the object. 
regardless of where we put the object in front of the mirror, it will always form images with these characteristics. Now, let us look at spherical mirrors. Spherical mirrors are round mirrors with either internal or external reflective surfaces. The centermost part of the mirror is the center of curvature, denoted as the letter C. The next important point is the focal point, denoted by the letter F in uppercase. This marks the point in which the light rays would converge or meet. However, this is not the location of the image. Next is we have the principal axis. This is the line where the object and all the points rest. And lastly, we have the vertex denoted by the symbol V. It is the point where the mirror crosses the principal axis. It is also very useful for the measurement of the positions of the points, objects, and the images. From the vertex to any of the focal points here, this distance is called the focal length denoted by the small letter F. It tells how far the focus is from the surface from the mirror. Another important distance is the radius or half of the sphere. This is measured from the vertex up to the center of curvature. These points will be useful and important for both analytical and graphical prediction of the formation of images in spherical mirrors. The reflective surfaces of the spherical mirrors may either be from the inside or on the outside. If the reflective surface is the one inside or in the interior of the sphere, it is called a concave mirror. Its center of curvature and focal points are both positive in values. On the other hand, if the reflective surface is outside the sphere or at the exterior, the mirror is said to be convex. It has a negative curvature and a negative focal point. The major differences between the two types of spherical mirrors are the position of the reflective surface and the sign conventions of the points. The vertex is similar for the two in which the vertex is always zero. The image formation on spherical mirrors through analytical and ray diagramming methods will be discussed on the next video lessons. To conclude this lesson, let us review the following key points. The law of reflection states that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. A mirror is any smooth reflecting surface which can be either plane or spherical. The qualitative characteristics of an image are described using its location, orientation, type, and size. An image formed by a plane mirror is always virtual, upright, laterally reversed, and has the same size and distance with the object. And lastly, an image formed by a spherical mirror depends on the object's location relative to the mirror's vertex, focus, and center of curvature. And that ends our discussion on the reflection of light.